All right. Hi there, everyone. Hope you can all hear me well. Um, my name is Ben. I work for California State Parks here at the Oceano Dunes District. Um, before I get going any further, um, go ahead and try to give me a thumbs up button if you can all hear me and see me well. Perfect. I'm saying, oh, ha hands up. My bad. Not thumbs up. Perfect. Lots of hands up. Perfect. Cool. All right. The broadcast is working. I'll go ahead and lower those hands now. All right. Cool. So once again, my name is Ben. Thanks for joining me today at this virtual home learning program. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you today. We're going to learn about lots of things from the rock cycle to um, the weathering to what kind of animals live out here in this very unique habitat in my state parks. Before I get going, I want to encourage you to check out our Ports website here. It's a www.ports-ca.us. Um, on, on that website, you'll see a whole list of programs, full scheduling from different parks throughout the state. So if you enjoy this program today, there's going to be lots more um, home learning opportunities for all you kids at home. Um, hopefully, you'll sign up for some more of those. All right, so now, now before we officially get started, I just want to take a moment to be really quiet, do a little deep breathing, and kind of just check out this area that I'm in. All right, ready? So let's take a few deep breaths as I pan the camera. Let's go. Cool. All right, hope you guys enjoyed that. So this park is called the Oceana Dunes State Vehicular Recre Recreational Area. Um, it is a sand dune habitat, which we'll be talking a lot about today. As you can see behind me, it's also a beach habitat. That's the Pacific Ocean right behind me. Um, it's a pretty, pretty awesome park. It has lots of different, different habitats and different animals that live here. Um, before we get started, I'm going to encourage you to grab a piece of paper, a pen, and a pencil. Pen or pencil, either one. Because throughout the program, I'm going to ask you a few questions so you can write down your answers. I'm also going to ask you to draw some pictures. You can draw your pictures on there. And if you have any questions for me throughout any time of the program, go ahead and write them down on your papers so you can remember them at the end. And then I'm going to have an opportunity for you to write down your questions on a, on a different website at the end. So we can try to go back and answer anything that's unclear for you today. Cool. And also make sure you have a few feet of cleared space around you. Because we're going to get up and move a little bit up certain points today. Try to be a little active. So make sure there's not a table or chair or anything you'll run, run into um, when we start jumping around a little bit. Cool. So now to officially get started. Once again, my name is Ben. I'm here in the Oceana Dunes. Um, today we're going to be talking about the rock cycle. Uh, animal adaptations, plant adaptations that allow them to live in this very unique habitat here. So, here we go. So, you guys probably now wondering where exactly I am in this park. Ocean of Dunes, you may never even heard of that park before. So I'm going to share a map with you so you'll see exactly where this park is relative to yourself. Get this up for you one second. All right, so here's our park sign, the Oceana Dunes State Vendicular Recreation Area. Here's a map of the U.S. Go ahead and raise your hand right now if you guys are in California. I'm curious how many live in California. Cool, I see 40, 70. Oh, it's all up to 100. Sweet. So we're going to circle this for you. That, that blue dot is us. We're inside California, like lots of you are. Very cool. All right. Here's the, oops. Here's a close up of California. That blue dot is still us. We're getting a little bit closer. And here's our park map. So we are near the town of Oceano, hence the name, on the central coast of California with the beautiful Pacific Ocean on our west coast. Now, do you guys see all of that white stuff on the map? I'll circle it for you. All of that white stuff. What could that be? Uh, do you think it's snow? What do you think it's snow? Maybe it's some type of a lake, white lake. No, I don't think it's that. Maybe it's sand. Anybody think it's sand? If you think it's sand, you are correct. It is totally sand. Those are our sand dunes. We call them coastal sand dunes. They're a very unique habitat that not very much of California has. Turn that off. And as you can see in front of you, those are our coastal sand dunes. They show up on the map. I'll send some butterflies flying by. All right. So you may ask, how in the world do the coastal sand dunes form? They're pretty, pretty weird looking, right? 
just piles of sand in the middle of the coast. Well, the sand, as you can see here, all this sand actually starts out as rocks and local mountain ranges. Further inland, um, local mountain ranges, um, they're set made of all types of rock, sedimentary rock, igneous rock, um, and then we go through a process called weathering. And that's one of the important terms we're gonna talk about today. So on your paper, go and write down your best guess of what you think weathering is. Try to define that science term. And if you don't know, don't worry. Just take your best guess at it. And I'll go and define it for you in a minute here. So go and write down what you think weathering is. It's a tricky one, but don't worry. Give it your best shot. All right, so whatever your guess was, thanks for writing down. Weathering, the way we define it is kind of the natural process that breaks rock down to smaller and smaller pieces through um, weather events like wind, rain, and snow. So it's the natural process that breaks rocks down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, so that's how you start with rocks about this size, nice piece of granite here, and weathering We'll pelt this in local mountains with rain, wind, snow, just keep beating it, beating it, beating it. Eventually, it'll break down the rocks about this size. You can see kind of pebble size here. And weather will keep on going and never stops. We'll eventually get kind of a little granular sand here. It's still sand, but not quite as thin as the sand we have here. And the final process is when, when the sand enters the local creeks. I'm gonna share some pictures with you so you can get a better mental image of what I'm talking about. So the rocks start out in local mountain ranges, right? They get pelted with wind, rain, snow, and they enter local creeks. And then where do you think local creeks end up at? So here's a local mountain range. It's a nice kind of picturesque picture. You see all those rocks, they're big and strong. Eventually there will be a storm come through, rocks will enter local creeks and watersheds. They'll work their way down into the watershed. And what do you think watersheds end up at? Anybody have a guess of where most creeks in California end up emptying into? There's another nice creek. You see some of the bigger rocks there slowly breaking down. Do you think they all empty out into the ocean? You'd be correct. Here's a picture of our park, actually. That is the Arroyo Grande Creek. And that is the local creek that empties out right into the ocean. And it doesn't only empty out water, it empties out sand or rocks slightly larger than sand. But once those rocks enter the ocean, they go through the final process of, of weathering where they get pounded by waves and they finally get broken up into what we know as sand today. I'll pick it up a little bit more for you. We have really fine sand here. And that's a very important process in how sand dunes get formed because once that sand enters the ocean, it doesn't go too far. We have very strong uh, ocean currents here and big waves knock all that sand right back onto the beach. And then we have strong coastal winds, which is why we have sand dunes here, because that wind will just push that sand further inland, pick it up off the beach, dry it out, push it inland until it runs into something else. So sand will just keep blowing until it runs to another sand dune or pile of vegetation or something like that. And that's how sand dunes get formed. So sand gets pushed in, runs to another sand dune, this continue to build up higher and higher. I have one more picture to show you to clarify that process. Here's that. So the ocean will be on the west side. The wind will blow the sand inland. It'll build a nice high sand dune. Eventually when it gets too tall, it'll actually slip off. The backside will kind of fall and cave in, which creates what we call a slip face, which is kind of a, what makes the nice bowls here in our sand dunes, makes them so picturesque. All right, go and unshare that. You get the picture. Cool. So that's sand new formation, a little bit about the rock cycle, a little bit about weathering. Now, I have a question. Do you guys think that any animals or plants are able to survive in this very dry, very sandy habitat around me? Obviously you can see some plants there, but go ahead and raise your hand if you think that it's actually impossible for any animals to live here. Raise your hand if you think it's impossible for animals to live here. 
Ooh, I see the number of hands going down. You guys are smart. I try to trick you, but you're right. It is very possible animals live here. We have lots of animals that have really cool adaptations, which a lot of them live in the sandy habitat, because this is pretty tricky to live here, right? It's very sandy, not very much food, not very much water. So I'm gonna talk to you about one of my favorite animals today, the kangaroo rat. Kangaroo rat is a very cool rodent that lives out here in the sand dunes. Um, I have a model here, a little stuffed model for you. As you can see here, they're pretty cool. It's not life size, but you can see disproportional for how long their tail is. All right, so kangaroo rats, um, they're able to live out here. What are, what are three things that kangaroo rats need to live, and all animals need to live out here in the sand dunes? Maybe they need food. What are the, what are the two things I'm looking for? There's three main things, food, maybe water. Yep, definitely water. And maybe shelter from the wind and the sun and the sand. So those are the three main things that they look for out here in the sand dunes. Wind, sorry, food, water, and shelter. The ways kangaroo rats have adapted to get those three necessities is pretty cool. So one of them is they've adapted to live underground. That's your shelter. So I have another picture to show you of kangaroo rats. Pull it up for you. So kangaroo rats actually live in tunnels underneath the ground to escape from the wind and the really harsh sun out here. So they dig tunnels again underneath the sand where it's nice and cool, a little more moist. That's a great adaptation for their shelter. There's another live picture of a kangaroo rat. Check out that tail and their hind legs. So what I'm gonna actually have you guys do right now is go and draw or sketch your best, best, uh, best you can a picture of a kangaroo rat on your paper. Focus on those big hind legs. We'll talk about those in a little bit. They're very important for the kangaroo rat as well. Go and sketch that big tail. Very tall ears. Give it your best shot. Even if you're not an artist, don't worry. Just give it a shot. Try to be a little, a little creative today. All right, I hope you guys are still drawing that. kangaroo rat to show you. You can draw this one as well here. Let me turn it out for you. Hope you guys can see that. Real life size kangaroo rat. Check out that really long tail with the very strong powerful hind legs. All right. Now this is part of the program where I'm going to need you to make sure you have a little bit of space around you because we're going to do a little activity. So kangaroo rats, or another adaptation they have is how they escape from predators. Out here they have snakes that try to eat them, birds that try to catch them. But what they can do is they can actually jump really quick and really high with those really strong hind legs that they have. So we're gonna practice jumping like a kangaroo rat. So make sure you got everything clear around you. Maybe you stretch out your legs a little bit, get a little loose. On the count of three, I'm gonna have you guys jump as high as you can, just like a kangaroo rat, off two legs, all right? So let's get ready. On the count of three, ready? One, two, three, jump. And let's do it one more time. One, two, three, jump. Nice. Perfect. Hope you guys did that. All right. Landed safely. Now, how high do you think you jump? Maybe a foot, maybe two feet. If you can jump really high, maybe even three feet. The kangaroo rats can actually jump nine to ten feet in either direction, going in a perimeter, going vertical. They can jump nine to ten feet, which is crazy for how small those guys are. Humans, we can jump like three feet, maybe, maybe four feet. Kangaroo rats can jump up to nine to 10 feet just to escape, just to escape the predators. It's a really awesome adaptation they have. Another adaptation they have is how they get their water. So while I get this picture ready for you guys, go ahead and try to come up with ideas of where they get their water from. There's no lakes out here in the sand dunes. So where do they drink their water? That's a tricky question. All right, so that is an upside down kangaroo rat. That's their mouth with lots of little seeds kind of stored in their cheeks. So they eat seeds, that's their main source of food, but it's also their main source of water. I doubt anybody guessed that. You probably guessed from the rain or from the creek. They actually get all their water from the seeds because the seeds have some moisture in them and they suck out that moisture and that's how they hydrate themselves, which is pretty crazy.
that's a great adaptation because there's no, no lakes out here in the sand dunes. Here's one of our environmental scientists holding a kangaroo rat. He's not hurting him, don't worry. They just go out there to research them, to make sure they're living safely out in the sand dunes. It's a pretty awesome adaptation, huh? Never would have thought that an animal could get all their water just from seeds. Who would have thought that? All right. Now we're going to move on to our next animal. We actually have two animals in unison that we're going to talk about. There are two very special birds we have living out here in the sand dunes called the snowy plover and the California least tern. I'm going to go ahead and pick up the camera here and kind of show you the habitat as I talk about them. Pick up the iPad. Hopefully I won't drop it. Perfect. So behind me you can see the uh, creek I was talking about earlier, the Arroyo Grande Creek. Hippies are right in the ocean right there. And this habitat that you're seeing is actually where snowy plovers and uh, California least terns make their nests. So unlike most birds, they don't make their nests in trees. They make their nests in the sand along the ocean, along the shoreline. Some cool, some cool footage of the uh, sand dunes as I'm walking back to our tripod here. So that's a cool adaptation to make their nests right in the sand, right? But there's actually some problems that have been coming up with that lately. You guys have any ideas of what problems could come from making your nests, find, uh, laying your eggs right in the sand along the shoreline? Lots of humans go by, lots of animals go by. I'll give you a second to try to think of what, what issues could come from laying your eggs right there. All right, so as you're thinking, I'll get some pictures ready for you of these snowy plovers and loose turns. So there's a snowy plover. As you can see, she has two little fresh hatchlings underneath her wing there. And right in the sand, just like I said, right? They're not up in a tree. There's a little baby snowy plover. So some issues that come up, I bet you guys have guessed some of these, is if they're laying their eggs right on the sand, what if people step on them? Or what if dogs find them? Or what if a, a car comes through or if somebody builds a house near the beach and that's where the snow plover used to hatch, used to lay their eggs? And those are all serious issues facing the snowy plover, which is one reason why it's actually a threatened species now. Um, and, and California least terns are endangered species. And both of those, uh, terms mean that they're not doing very well. There's not very many of them left alive. Um, their population is decreasing. And the worst that we can get to is extinct. I'm sure you guys know what extinct means. It means there's no more of those animals left. So snowy plovers are threatened and California Easterns are endangered because their population has been decreasing because they've been losing habitat. Um, they lay their eggs along the beach. They've been losing habitat as humans build buildings where they used to lay their eggs. Um, it's not, not a great situation, but there is good news. Because here at California State Parks, we have lots of scientists who are working and rangers who are working hard to try to save these birds, to try to help their populations. Like you saw that one picture of our scientists holding the kangaroo rat. We have lots of those, lots of those hardworking scientists trying their best to preserve some of the plover habitat um, and, and, West, and California eastern habitat to try to help them out. Now it kind of goes into my next subject. I'm going to be talking about a certain plant here. We do have plants, not just animals, um, not just kangaroo rats, even though those are my favorite. We have lots of animals and plants that live here. And one plant I'm going to talk about is called ice plant. And I bet you have all seen ice plant. Go ahead and raise your hand. Once I get this picture of ice plant up, let me know if you've seen this plant before, because I bet you, you probably have. All right, there's a picture of ice plant. Go ahead and raise your hand if you've seen something that looks like that before. Yep, I'm seeing lots of hands go up. It's gone to over 100 hands. Yeah, it's very common here in California. It's actually pretty, it's a pretty flower, right? Nice and picturesque, makes a good garden plant. The only problem is it's not native here. So this is an invasive species here in the sand dunes. Invasive species are species that are not native to the area. They're from somewhere else and they get brought over and they kind of take over the whole area. So they grow really rapidly. They spread around and take over other plants so nothing else can grow there. So that's what ice plant is. You know, the close up of the flower. So you might ask, well, if it's not native, where did it come from? Where did ice plant come from? 
It was a picture of a deer and some ice plant. So ice plant is actually native to South Africa, which is way over there on a whole other continent. And then if it's native to South Africa, how in the world did it get all the way over to California and the west coast of the US? Well, it was actually humans who brought it over because ice plant can't move by itself. It's not a bird, so it can't fly over continents or oceans. Humans brought it over and we planted it along railroads and different roads in California to kind of prevent erosion, to kind of hold dirt in place so the wind wouldn't run away in the rain or something. But we didn't, people who did that didn't realize how invasive it was or how invasive it would end up being. And it just kind of, once it was planted to do its purpose, it kind of exploded and took over. And the reason that's an issue is back here in the deer picture, deer, which is a native animal, can't eat ice plant because it didn't evolve with it over time. So ice plant, deer's never seen it before and they haven't evolved to eat it. So you see it sniffing around like, oh, what is this plant? I don't know what this is. I can't really eat this. So I have to move on and look for other plants to eat. And if ice plant ends up taking over all the different area, deer won't have anything to eat. Um, if, if it grows over the sand, so many plovers can't lay their eggs there. So ice plant and invasive species in general are a pretty, pretty big issue here in the dunes. But once again, there's good news because we have those environmental scientists who work for state parks and rangers who also work hard to kind of clear as much ice plants as they can to plant more native plants, more native species, to try to um, try to rehabilitate the, uh, try to restore the habitat, the native habitat here. Pretty cool. All right, we're gonna grab K rat one more time. You guys remember drawing the K rat and the long tail and the hind legs? Cool. So if you have that drawing finished. If you finish it later today, at any point, go and give it to your teacher or your parent or guardian who's with you. And if they upload it to social media, Instagram or Facebook, and they use this hashtag here, hashtag PortsFan, hashtag PortsFanArt, and then hopefully we'll be able to see it, and then we'll repost it and we'll share it um, to get those really cool pictures out there. And we want to see your artwork that you've been drawing today based off what we, the information we're giving you. So if you, parents or guardians, use this hashtag, and post on Facebook or Instagram, we'll see it and we can repost it hopefully. And that'd be really cool, really cool trip. All right, I have a few more pictures to share with you before we finish up for the day. So you guys learned a lot about what animals we have out in the sand dunes in front of me. I wanna show you a few pictures of the animals we have behind me in the ocean, because those are always a fan favorite. Who knows what that animal is? Go ahead and raise your hand if you know what that animal is. Awesome, I see the hands skyrocketing again. Perfect. You guys probably know, it's a great white shark. Nice, over 200 of you knew what that was. You guys are smart. The great white shark, and we do have them living out here in the Pacific Ocean. You see him once in a while here, just cruising up and down the coast. How about this next one? I'll go and lower those hands. So I'll see. Who knows what this next animal is? Who knows what kind of shark that is? Go ahead and raise your hand. Nice, lots of hands going up. Not quite as many as the great white, so it's a little bit of a mystery. Try to guess what it is. Look at the stripes. What kind of animal could that be named after? I'll give you a hint. It's named after a big cat. A certain big cat lives in jungles. What kind of shark could that be? Hmm. Is it a lion shark? Nope, not lion shark. Is it a tiger shark? No, we actually do have tiger sharks, but this is not one of them. It's a leopard shark. Leopard sharks are one of my favorite. They're pretty small sharks that live out here in the ocean. And actually what they eat is just kind of shells and mollusks and clams and other things that live on the bottom of the ocean. But you can see their mouth is on the bottom of their face instead of great whites, which is on the front of their face. So since the mouth is on the bottom of their face, they go cruise around the bottom of the ocean and suck things up off the ground like clams and mollusks and kind of crack those open and eat them. Pretty cool. All right, one more I think I got for you. Who knows what those are? Raise your hand. I should see all the hands go up here, hopefully. Nice, yes, the most hands ever. These are dolphins. We see all kinds of dolphins out here behind me in the Pacific Ocean. Dolphins are awesome. You'll see them cruising by, surfing the waves sometimes, interacting with actual human surfers sometimes. We don't get too close to them though. 
Um, you got to keep your distance from, from wildlife. But you'll see them cruising up and down the coast, sometimes even with whales, which is really cool to see. Um, giant, giant whales with their dolphins, dolphin friends and relatives hanging behind them, cruising through the surf. A nice, beautiful, sunny day today. It was actually a great day to see whales and dolphins. I haven't seen any yet. I wanted to show you guys, but they haven't popped up. I'm keeping my eyes open. All right. Now I'm going to do one last activity before we sign off. I want to jump like a kangaroo out one more time so you get some more energy out because I know you've been sitting down and listening to me for a while, which I really appreciate. Hope you learned some cool things. So everybody ready? Clear your area. Make sure you got your area cleared away. This time we're going to jump three times in a row on the count of three like a kangaroo rat. One, two, three, one, two, three. Perfect. All right. Great job, everyone. Well, and one more thing before I sign off. Remember how I had you write down questions throughout the program so you can remember them at the end? So you have those questions written down and you want us to answer them for you. There's no chat going on in this program, but if you go to this website here, padlet.com slash Oceano Dunes slash questions. That is our park's interactive website. And if you go there and write down any questions that you have, we can go in and answer them and give you any information you have, anything that was unclear today. I know I covered a lot of different topics. Anything that was unclear, you can write them down on this website. And we'll hopefully be able to get back to you and answer any questions that you have. Cool. Well, all right. Thanks for joining me today, the Oceano Dunes, everyone. Hope you really enjoyed it. Once again, if you enjoyed this program or you want to check out other parks throughout the state, go and check out this website, ports-california.us, sorry, slash ca.us, not the full California. And there's going to be lots of different programs every day throughout the day at different California state parks for different home learning opportunities. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Ben signing off. Have a great day. Bye.